daughter, whose granddaughter became quite a famous model. She's not fat at all. She's very thin. Mm -hmm. he, he has a daughter called Kirsty or a granddaughter called Kirsty who's a famous model. She's very thin. Oh. She didn't inherit his, his genes. He's a mm. milkman. Mm. He died, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Why do I know the name Ruskin? He's in the Jovia Ruskin. Peasant government. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, it's a funny story. When it, I was here, oh. did you, you must have heard of him. Uh, he's, he's a group captain. Right. Anyway, at that time, half the establishment of, of Edinburgh Field was RAF. Of course, we had so much traffic going through all the time with the rumour of tests and so forth. And one night, Jill Cumming was coming back rather late in Mufti, and he drew up. Start again. Um, James, you, you've told us quite a few stories today, and quite a few amusing ones. Um, how did you keep your spirits up during the harder times, during the war? Well, I, I didn't find any hard times, really. I, I mean, the, sp the spirit in the mess was terrific, even when things were going ba badly. I mean, I had a good party in the evening, went off to bed, with a few beers under the belt, and, and woke up in the morning fresh for anything. And, and I, I don't think... Because I, I, I was never on a station like Beacon Hill where they got very heavily bombed. And, but then the they went out to the local pub there. I've, never, I, I've only met one chap who ever felt we might lose the war. And I, I don't think it was very common. But they see there were some marvellous Australians and things, and I think it's so sad that they're not remembered here. There was one fellow called Pat Hughes who was born in Cooma. His father was a schoolmaster there, and the family moved to Sydney when he was about 12, I think. And he went to uh, Point Cook. He joined the Australian Air Force, went to Point Cook, and he was seconded with half the course presumably the Australian government's approval, to the Royal Air Force. And during the Battle of Britain, he shot down something like 16 German aircraft. And you imagine what the strain he must have been under. I mean, fighting as far from home as you can get, fighting the only enemy that Australia was at war with at the time. But to have shot down 16 aircraft, he must have been in action a good many more times than that. He must have come back often with bullet holes in his aircraft. He must have come back often with somebody missing. And had to, he was a flight commander, probably had a right to their, to their relatives. He had uh, all the stress of landing on airfields covered with bomb craters and sort of thing. And yet, no one here is in the slightest bit interested except in his hometown in Cooma. There's a monument in the Cooma by the woman over there about, for, of him. It's a rather unusual one. It just shows the, a map of the way he operated. But I mean, you can't think of anyone, uh, even in Greek history, uh, any great hero who did more than that. And yet he's completely forgotten. I, it's rather sad, rather disgraceful, I think. But then because the war was run by army, and they would not be interested in the Navy or the Air Force, really. How um, much was the war in evidence as it, as it got on towards the final couple of years in terms of bombings? I mean, were bomb sites common or was it just centred around London? Well, it's mostly in London because I, I did my last tour in, in the Air Ministry and I was living in Chelsea and uh, one got so used to it, you know, you, you, you went out to a pub in the evening and got a, ta you got a taxi or a bus, it was all running as usual, uh, the bombs were going all over the place. I was once drinking in, the, in a pub called Shepherd's in Shepherd's Market, an old Dickensian type of pub. And uh, there was a very heavy air raid going on, and there were bombs dropping over the place, and there were all the guns in Hyde Park going off, so the noise outside was actually deafening. And I was with three other fighter pilots. One was a Canadian who'd lost a, 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 an arm in, or a hand in, in Malta. One was an Australian who'd lost an eye. And one was a New Zealander who was undamaged. And the manager came in and said, look, I think the air raid is getting so heavy, it would be wiser to go down to the restaurant underneath, because if the place is hit, there's an escape route from the restaurant through the, where they would lay the, the beer in, through the pavement outside. We just lined up four pints of beer. So this Australian, I can't remember his name now, he said, I'm not going to spill my beer and go down the stairs. No one's going to pinch my beer. So he took his glass eye out and dropped it into the bottom of the glass. And the Canadian said, well, no one will pitch mine. He unhooked his hand. I said, they got to the mud. So well, New Zealand and I thought, we'd better drink ours up. And we, we went and drank there about an hour, and then we, we, we left. And as we left, we put our tin hats on as we stepped out, 
As we stepped out into the street, a bit of coping stone fell on this New Zealander's tin hat. An awful boing. And when he said, gosh, I bet that's made a wizard dent to show the chaps. He took his, head off to, his hat off to show us. Another bit fell on his head. He fell on the paper and was knocked out cold. Quite serious. He was carried off in an ambulance. He didn't get back on the flying game. He was so badly concussed. The moral of that, don't take your hat off to see what hit you. <laughs> was there an instruction about wearing tin hats outside after? No, nothing area? was laid down. Um, uh, one didn't often go, go, but it was extraordinary how one, one accepted the raids. I mean, um, living in Chelsea, we went out one morning, the house opposite had gone, the whole, whole place. An extraordinary thing, on the, on the third floor there was a mantelpiece with some photographs and a little vase of flowers stood on it, and the whole house had gone, and there were still extraordinary effects of flowers. And uh, we hadn't heard much, but, you know, the, the V2s were no problem because they went boom and you knew you were safe. But it was the v, V1s that were worrying. You wondered wondering whether you should get out of bed and get out of a cellar. You heard there's a rum, 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 and it would stop. You <laughs> got it, it come. There would be a great bag somewhere. <laughs> you go back to sleep again. Uh, but one got so used to it. Quite extraordinary. People just went on working as usual. You go out, go to a pub, or go to a, a, go to a pub and. Uh, have a, uh, a drink or two, and, uh, and everything just went on. But I was in the working in the industry when um, uh, in a Astral house when uh, Germany surrendered. I had been out to, I was caught in Eden. I'd been out to lunch with my wing commander at the ROC club, and we were driving back in a taxi along the Strand, rather late, and we saw a newspaper placard saying Germany surrenders. So we shouted at the taxi driver, turn around. <laughs> we said, take us to the scenery club. It was the only place we could rem it was open. It was a flying club. The pilots would join. And we drank there for a while. And, and he said, it was funny, nobody had turned up. I'd better ring up and see what's happening. So he rang up our director in the industry, and our commodore, and said, uh, have you heard the war's over? And he said, no, is it really? He said, yes, it is. <laughs> he said, well, I, he said, why don't you come and join us? And he said, well, I've got a few files I want to burn first. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then the whole lot turned up. We drank there until about five o'clock when the RAF club opened. And he said, well, come round to my place now. We went to the RAF club. And my brother-in-law, who was a navigator in, in Bomber Command and Mosquitoes, was on leave, staying with us. And, and my wife brought him round to the RAF club. And we drank there till it closed at 11. And it went out absolutely just into the, into the Piccadilly. It was an absolutely seething mass of people. But some of the conversation I heard was quite fascinating. There was there a Commodore talking to my brother-in-law, who was a flying officer. And I heard him say to the, uh, my brother-in-law, have another drink, my boy. I said, um, my brother-in-law says, no, sir, let me get you one. Then. No, certainly not. It's you young men who won the war. Oh, no, no, sir, it's your experience who won the war for us. Have another one, pick it a whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and then he said, we one ring men must stick together. <laughs> and I thought I got it in the music at the time of the night. Excuse me for one second. Oh. My, my brother. Oh, your brother, sorry. Was an, I was in the army in Burma. And he was at Impal and he got some leave and he went in, down into, into, into um, Delhi, not Delhi, to um, Calcutta on leave. And um, he got some, some, some whiskey and the bottle said, made in Glasgow, England, from the finest fruit. <laughs> and, but his, um, he had... He was absolutely bald, even when he was about 21. He just had a bit of hair over his ears. And when he came back from his leave, his, his batman said, was a, his batman was a, a Norfolk farm labourer, said, you've had your hair cut, sir? I said, yes, I have. The farmer said, what do they charge you, sir? He said, so many rupees. And this, this batman said, it's true. We share a sheep performance in Norfolk. <laughs> um, just getting back from the end of the war a little bit, you're in London to work for the Air Ministry. Can you tell us a bit more about what your job was there? Yes, to start with, I was in op operational training, uh, arranging programs for the new uh, uh, training units with after the for after the war, and um, that's why I got my back damaged in an ejector seat. I had to go down to Aston to uh, Martin Baker and check out this first ejector seat with him and see about the training device. To, 
Shaky Ronnie. And I went out one of those first ones, and they gave one's back a mighty thump. Went up 25 feet in a nanosecond or something of the sort. And it damaged so many backs, I, I had about three discs collapse. And uh, we just had one large shell that fired, and on the modern ones, there about three shells go off one after another as you get more gentle acceleration as you go out. Reaches the same speed at the top of the turn. Can you describe those seats for us? And uh, the, the, can you describe the earliest ejector seats for us? Yes, it was a very upright seat, and you had a, a blind behind you. See, so when you pulled the blind back, you sure that your spine was straight. And you pulled it back over your face like that, that fired it, and up you, up you went. And uh, you had to release the seat then to pull the parachute. And I think the modern ones go off automatically. But, um, what did you have to do to test it? or? Well, to see whether it was satisfactory for service use, for, for people to use. And, uh, as a result of that, they modified it and decided to put more gentle acceleration on it. But, uh, Were you uh, flying in the air or did you on the no, ground? No, on, on a ground rig. We just went up 30 feet in the air instead of a rig. They had these on all the, all the stages where the jets uh, for people to train on before they got into the aircraft to see what it was like. What else did you have to do in that operational training role? Well, I had to keep in touch with the operational training units to see whether the future plans were, were, were sensible. You know, you've got so many hours available for training and you want to put it to the best possible use and not be, have people wasting time just flying around doing nothing. Um, and, uh, it was quite an interesting exercise. The, uh, there were some interesting people in, in the thing too. There was a fellow called um, Onions who had been a, he was a squadron leader then. He'd been a, a sergeant pilot in Palestine before the war when Bomber Hatch was the air officer commanding the Middle East Air Force. And when Bomber Hatch went on a tour of his units, which stretched as far as, as Iraq, he offered the Army general in charge of the anti-aircraft gunners on the RAF station to come round with him. And this fellow, Onions, was detailed to fly the general. And they went, took about three weeks going out all these units because they were stretched as far as, uh, as, as Iraq. When they got back to Palestine and landed again, Bomber Hayes had landed first, came to help this old general out of the first Strindberg airplane. As he was helping him down, he noticed a hole through the wing. He called up the squad and said, look, bloody hole through the wing. Must have been that other encampment we passed over in the hills at so-and-so. Can't have that sort of nonsense. Bomb up. Bomb them out. So the whole squadron took off and bombed this other encampment. And when he landed again afterwards, the armourer said, Sarge, you've dropped the bomb. And he said, certainly I have. Look, they uh, out of his shooting at the to hose with the wing. And the armourer said, sorry, Sarge, I should have told you what, but I slipped on the wing when I was cleaning the guns this morning and the ramrod went through. <laughs> How we made friends and influenced people. <laughs> no wonder they don't like us. <laughs> uh, during your time with the Air Ministry, were you were working with the French, is that right? Yes, after that I, I was promoted to acting rank and to take over the French section of the Air Ministry. And uh, that was uh, very interesting, we were dealing with the French Air Force, the squadron was very important, the French Naval Air, Air Service to deal with too. They were nearly all Bretons and, and uh, interesting people. And of course, after the invade, after they got back into France, they had all sorts of contacts with them again, and dealing with problems. Where were you when those D-Day invasions occurred? I was um, I was still at at, um, at White Walton. I was still at um, at Croydon, which was before I went to the embassy. I was just about that time I was posted on the Staff College course, the Jewish course. We'll go back and cover that because we haven't talked much about uh, Croydon or the Staff College at all. But just while we're talking about the French, apart from them being Britons, what insights did that did you get into the French military organisation and how it differed from the British? Well, it seemed very similar to me. I mean, when it, when I went to the French Air Ministry to conferences, it seemed very similar to the system. They were interesting people. I, I met, they changed their chief of, of staff every time the government changed, which is about every three months. <laughs> and they had a completely new set of people to know. Uh, and 
and nearly all the generals were about so high, <laughs> really small people, but um, quite competent aviators. And um, they'd had a pretty rough time because they were, throughout the war, they were uh, cut off from their families. And Although I had one Belgian pilot that I knew right through the war, and uh, I flew down to see him one day towards the end of the war. And um, when I landed, the station one said, I'm sorry, you, you've missed uh, uh, you've missed him. He's just gone off t to shoot the man who betrayed his father, the Gestapo. His village has just been li liberated. And he'll be back after lunch, so stay and have lunch with me. Uh, then I called de Vivier, Roger de Vivier, who was a wing commander then. So I stayed. After lunch, the Spitfire came back and landed, and I went out to meet him. And I said, hello, Roger, how's it going? He was looking like a sunlight. He said, my bloody brother got there first. <laughs> His brother had shot this fellow. <laughs> but he was shot down um, quite early on in, in the war over, over France. And he, and he was quite a long time coming back. And he eventually got through the escape route and came back. But... Um, he said to the station, to his squadron commander, I'm sorry I've been so long, but when I was over there, I thought I'd take some leaves. I went home to Belgium. I spent a fortnight with my family. Then I got onto the escape route from there. <laughs> and came back quite happily. <laughs> He's quite a chap. And uh, at the end of the war, just after the end of the war, society in Belgium, which provided motor cars to, to look after the war wounded people, invited 30 Grand Ambulies de Guerre from the Battle of Britain. We couldn't raise as many as that because nearly all the Dutch were badly injured and had gone out of the service. But I made up the numbers by bringing in my brother-in-law who hurt his backside landing with the wheels up. <laughs> That's all this sort of chap. We arrived at uh, Isa at uh, uh, Uxair in, in the airport in Brussels. We were met by a band and a guard of honour and a, the president of the society who was a judge with a long white beard. And... Uh, the rows of wheelchairs, and we all stepped heartily out because we were all fit chaps. I mean, they wouldn't still be in the Air Force if we were on wheelchairs. And um, they were all terribly disappointed. We had a marvellous time. They took us round everywhere. We were put up in the best hotels everywhere. We stayed in Brussels a few days. We had an excellent dinner in the Grand Hotel there. And um, in, in the um, uh, uh, Hotel de Ville, uh, marvellous entertainment going on everywhere. Everywhere, village we came to, they all turned out and cheered and bought us flowers and you know, we dropped in at the next war memorial we came to. We went uh, to Antwerp and Liège and Bruges and everywhere. And uh, we got so intoxicated at the end, we were, our group captain, a fellow called Tom Glee, who got rather badly burned in the battle, he was um, a, a, a senior chap and he got so intoxicated that in this... We were staying at the spa there, and there were some old English ladies in, uh, taking the waters. And of course, they all agog to come and meet us. And he spoke no French at all, but he was trying to... They were speaking English, and he was thought they were talking French. So he was saying, oui, oui, and that sort of thing, about all he could do. And they said, but we're English. He said, oui, oui, just say, and this went on. It's absolutely ludicrous. I've never seen a chap quite so intoxicated. But we had a terrible time in... Uh, in Liège, we were shown around the Gestapo headquarters there by a woman who had no fingernails and, 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 and no teeth. And it was really gruesome. We went down to this, it was an old fort built in Napoleonic times. And down below in the dungeon area, it was all, all the passages were zigzag because you couldn't fire down them. And she showed us where they were tortured. It really was gruesome. They were kept waiting in this ice cold place below the ground with no clothes on at all in a line and they could hear what was going on to the chaps who were being tortured ahead of them and see the blood running across this sort of thing absolutely gruesome absolute monsters that those people were and uh, uh, of course as soon as they told them what they wanted to know they were shot she was it. but um, she managed to hang out despite the tortures and I met in Norway too, I was, when I was up in the mountains there skiing with my family and we were waiting for the children to catch up and a, a Norwegian couple came and stopped beside us. And um, 
we got chatting with them. We said, where do you have children? They'd followed some fox tracks and gone into the fox track, but they joined us. We went down the valley. We were in the highest hut in the valley. So we said, to come and have a drink on the way down. So they did. And she made some very nice remarks about our children. My wife said, have you got any children? And the whole story burst out. He'd been in the resistance, been caught by the Gestapo, and they tortured her with an electric soldering iron so she couldn't have any children to make him talk. And luckily this happened at the end of the war. He was, we, we rescued him when we took over. And he was put at the docks to catch this Gestapo major going back to Germany. So he sat in the sentry box watching the troops going on board these ships to go back to Germany. And after three days, he saw this fellow, a, a major, dressed as a private, coming up the line of troops. And he worked out such a hate that by the time the ship got to the head of the queue and was about to go onto the ship, he rushed up to him, seed like bashed him over the side, and he fell into the water at the, between the ship and the dock. And he swam along and climbed, started climbing up an iron ladder. And this Norwegian went and kicked him and, and killed him. And all the troops cheered. They knew who this chap was. So they really were a lot of bastards, weren't they? And I met another fellow at an investiture at the embassy. He was getting an MBE or something. He was, he was caught by the Gestapo tapping out a message to say the interpreter was getting up steam. And while he was tapping it out, the door burst open and the Gestapo major, about five troopers, rushed at him. He managed to throw his, his cipher book into the, into the stove and the major got burnt trying to get it out and didn't succeed. And they took him down into Toronto took them about 10 hours, and by the time they got there, the turbos had been sunk. Uh, and they knocked the hell out of him. I, I don't know how you, you can resist. I'm, I would tell them everything, I'm sure. And he said, you wouldn't, you know, because all they want to know is who your boss is, and they can do the same to him as soon as, you, as, soon as you get, they get hold of him. And he said, you get so bloody-minded. He said, when they're kicking you in the balls, you think, thank God they're not kicking me in the teeth. And when they're kicking you in the teeth, you think, thank God they're not kicking me in the balls. I don't think I could feel like that at all. <laughs> I mean, I just find it very differently, but some of those chaps really were tough. In your dealings with the French at the end of the war, um, was there a distinction between collaborators and those who, who hadn't collaborated? Or? Oh, Lord, yes, they were mostly bumped off, as everyone knows. But I, I found in, an extraordinary thing in Norway, when I was there in 1948, the, um, it was just after the Czech coup took in pla taken place, and the Norwegians were terribly nervous. They thought they were next on the list because they had a common border with, with Russia and quite a, a strong communist party. And they were all very jumpy. And the police in the north of Norway, quite cleverly, went in at night on skis and took over a communist conference centre in the north of Norway. And they took it over with all the papers and everything. And they were very unsure. They had a conference with the security chiefs of the three services of the police. They were very unsure of the security chief in Oslo, a fellow called Evang. His wife was known to have been a member of the Communist Party. They didn't trust him. They wanted to send these papers back to England without any, anything leaking in Oslo. And the Air Force chaps, well, I know, I've known James Carr a long time. I'm sure if he said he would do this, he would do it. So this fellow came around to see me, the great chief of papers, and said, look, could I pass them back to London without them leaking in Oslo? I said, certainly. And I didn't have more than about three days before the bag went to look at these papers. And they had complete lecture notes, slides, and everything else. And I only had time to look about the, about the British side of it. But they'd, some little man in Moscow decided that the British economy depended very largely on the export of motor cars and shipping. And so the aim was to reduce the output of the shipyards and the, and the motor factories by 36%, or what it was. And it gave lectures on how to decide which parts of the factory to have it in, so how to get the strike going, which you need to get your own shop steward in that position. So how you get rid of the old shop steward, all the dirty tricks to do that. How to get your own man in and all the dirty tricks of that, you know. But the last bit you put notes up saying the meeting's been postponed for two hours and you only your own chaps turn up and those sort of things. And um, having got your own men in, how to keep the strike going long enough to bring the production rate down. And then when that has to get you back to work, how you then start a, a, a strike in a subsidiary factory making carpenters or something else that's going to delay it all. And how to cause a fire in the paintworks and how to cause a Put sand in the machine, all these sort of things. And same with the ship lads, how to stop the delivery of steel, how to uh, f get the train drivers on strike, and then when they come off strike, how to get someone else on strike. Um, I read all this through, and I passed it back to London, and I never heard another word. And I suppose old Phil, be one of his other traitors in London, put it in the waste paper, I never heard any more about it. But in the meantime, the new Queen Mary 
that has been made in, in France. <laughs> but there's no shipyard left in my... In, in, in my in bloody fools, I went on strike, and they've done as a lot of work. Uh, good. I mean, and the same the motor industry, which Rolls Royce has been taken over by Volkswagen and all the other factories are very inefficient uh, because of all these strikes. It's maddening that some other country can, can, without going to war, can ruin a country like that. <laughs> Just moving back um, again in time to Croydon, where you were working on delivery flights. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the pilots you worked with in that job? Yes, they were all kinds of fighter pilots, um, the Poles, the Czechs, and all people having a rest from, from flying. Which caused a lot of trouble in some ways. I had one, uh, had a visit from two military police, uh, Spanish police. Asked me to investigate a, one of my Polish pilots. And um, because we were delivering aircraft, we had a use of, of railway warrants. So, so when you went away, you just went and got a railway warrant, filled in the card for, and came up by train. Well, this chap had a. Um, was married, so he didn't really need much petrol for leave or anything. But he had a friend in the Polish wing fly, uh, who was on full flying duty who got um, full uh, petrol allowance, but he didn't, didn't have, use a car. But he, his girlfriend was up in Glasgow, so, so he had to go by train every time. So what he was doing was he got a racket with this pole in my squadron who provided him with warrants, and he gave him in exchange the surplus petrol through coupons, you see. <laughs> and of course, it was obvious the, the coupons didn't tally when they brought them back. So he was very quick caught. Now I called this fellow in. I told him what a bloody fool I was. And I said, now look, if I take this forward and let this go, you'll be court-martialed. And you'll be thrown out of the service of the economy, and you'll lose any benefits you might have accrued. Do have some common sense. Fill those coupons in, find from your friend where they were used, fill them in, we'll put them back in the book and we'll say no more about it. The bloody fool filled them in for both the spaces near airfields which were not yet, didn't tally with the results and of course he was caught martial. Because there are some bloody fools about on there, really are. I had the same thing with the, uh, when I was in Norway, I had a, a, a flight sergeant looking after my aeroplane and uh, he'd been there when it, there was a Royal Air Force wing there. And he'd been kept on. When he was kept on, he was put in charge of security for a big dump of, of stores which were left behind, waiting to be dispersed, disposed of. And among these stores were some films owned by the, uh, the NAFI who did the, the provision of films for entertainment. And among these was a, f a film called Henry the, the Fifth. And the manager of the Eagle Line Films in Oslo was trying to get this film in, in Oslo. And he went over to London to argue the case for having this film. And the fellow said, well, I'll, 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 I'll see what I can do. But I'm coming up to see you ne next month, and we'll discuss it then. Well, this manager came in a month's time, and they went out to, to, to dinner with some mutual friends, where they laid on this film. And they said, where the hell did you get that from? And they got it from the local... Um, dealer in, the, in the, a big shop that sells m f um, cameras and things in, in Oslo, which had all these films. And this silly fool with a f local policeman had sold these films for 10 bucks. And, <laughs> and I said, well, you are a bloody fool. You're a, a flight lieutenant, I mean, a, a flight sergeant. You'll be retired if you don't get promoted in about three or four years' time on a pension of about a thousand pounds a year. For ten shillings, you've thrown the whole lot away, you'll be court-martialed, imprisoned, thrown out without any pensions. You've thrown all that away for ten shillings. How stupid can you be? I said, look, I'll give you a chance to get out of this. Uh, I'll take a board of inquiry, I'll ask you a lot of questions. And if you say yes to any of them, I've got no sympathy with you. I took a board of inquiry on this and got it out, out of it, but it, it was... But people are really are stupid. I had the same thing with the driver in South Africa, who we went on a journey together by car, 
and came back and he put in for four nights accommodation and I only put in for two. <laughs> and I, I gave him such a rocket. I mean, it's so stupid. How can people be so stupid? It's extraordinary, isn't it? Did you ever encounter any women uh, flying as pilots in a delivery situation? Well, I, I met one or two and I was very impressed. I, I landed at an airfield and it was at Spitfire 14 where there was some small factory in a very small grass airfield in Oxfordshire. And I had difficulty getting into this airfield. I had to break like hell to stop. And I walked into the control tower and I said, God, it's a jolly small airfield to bring an aircraft like this in. But a young ATS girl there said, uh, ATA girl said, well, I didn't have any trouble. I bought in the Spit 14. <laughs> they feel killed very small. But they, they, were, they were very competent, some of them. I, I only met one or two. Um, what about the factories that you saw, the production or the places that you were taking air, aircraft to be? Uh, oh, I never saw the factories. I just delivered the aircraft and flew back again in, in, in another aircraft waiting for me. Uh, it would be another instinct to have seen them. Uh, I went. I don't think I went around any of the aircraft factories then. I went around many afterwards. What was your most common uh, job in that delivery role? I didn't have any, any st standard job. They were all different. I mean, some squadrons were being re-equipped with new aircraft. We had to deliver the new aircraft to them. Others were aircraft going back for modifications. But it was fascinating because we were flying a Mosquito one day and something else the next. And I got quite a fright flying the first time I flew a Mosquito. I had one to take off from Croydon. And Croydon's a, a, a saucer-shaped airfield. It goes down and it's quite small. And uh, this was a, a long-range Mosquito like bomber, and I, it was had a full a tank, and and I hadn't done much flying on twin engine aircraft. And I took off, and I went between a, a hangar and another building below the level of the hangars, trying to get height. I just got airborne, and I was trying to get height, and I didn't get up to my safety speed. I was almost out of London, t trying to climb with this weight on board. It was quite tricky sometimes with those sort of things because the tank shouldn't have been full. I was only going a short distance up. Did you get a chance to, to try these different aircraft at their paces and flying new hurricanes or mosquitoes? Or? No, uh, no, I didn't do anything like that. Um, of course, well, very often we were flying brand new aircraft down to squadrons, but they would uh, all been tested. After that, you went to the Staff College. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, that was a very interesting time because the, all the chiefs of staff lectured and the chief of staff and, and the head of intelligence. And that was fascinating, hearing about the, what was going on. Um, the head of intelligence was a, an academic, brilliant mind, and he was very good and uh, gave us a lot of insight to what was happening. And, intelligence field and how much we knew about things in Germany, which what it really astonished one. I mean, he was able to get one of his men, a colonel in the German air ministry, to post a man to Pienemunder to try to find out what fuel they were using in their rockets, in their V2s. And this fellow reported back that the men doing the refueling all seemed to get very white hair and that they were using peroxide. But all that's extraordinary. But you see, once you've got a chap under your control like that, in an in a organisation like that, and the same in Russia, in which we had the same sort of organisation, they couldn't get away because you said you wouldn't like the authorities to know you've been doing this. And of course, the tor awful torture they got from the Gestapo if they were caught. So once you've got a chap in your hands, you, 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 he was yours for life. And uh, there were these people working for us, and they were very reliable. I found an awful lot about what was going on. But, um, um, what were you being told? Or what were the classes that... Were you giving classes or being given classes at the staff college? Well, it was mostly lectures and we had to write papers on things and, and uh, use the information we got. And, 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 uh, uh, writing various types of staff, staff papers and, 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 and briefs and things. 
Where was that? It was at a uh, place called Church Cross, was the, where the Church of East Star College was going at that time. It was only a three months course, it was compressed from a year into three months uh, for the war, but you had no leave during that time, it was just one weekend. I was, uh, was out on leave from the Star College course for that weekend, I went up to town. I was driving back with my wife, I was quite near to Jerry's Cross and I saw a large Air Force Humber on the side of the road with the back wheel off. And there was the CNC Bomber Command, Bert Harris, pacing up and down up the, on the side of the road with an airman <coughs> taking the back wheel off. <laughs> so I drew up and ran across the road and saluted very smartly. He said, I see you're stuck, so can I offer you a lift? He said, no, thank you. If the bloody Air Council chooses to take my bloody spare wheel away, they can bloody well wait for me. <laughs> and he was on his way up to an MST conference. And, and the Air Council had taken all the spare wheels away from service vehicles as an economy measure to stop, cut down the production. And I suppose and <laughs> he, he really was actually living. <laughs> was that your only encounter with him? Hmm? Was that your only encounter with him? Well, I met him in, in South Africa again. And um, uh, that's what I think it probably was. Um, there were some, some very good uh, senior officers in the Air Force at one time. They varied a bit. But I only once met an unpleasant one. It's a man called Frissage. And he's one of those r r r r very unpleasant people. A natural unpleasant man and, and a, a brusque and you bloody will do this sort of attitude. And um, when he was commander in chief in Singapore, he had flown out in one of the service aircraft, a brand new Jaguar, and he had it put up on, on stands in a hangar there and, and covered with a sheet and service every now and then. And after two years, he, uh, he briefed a crew of an RAF aircraft to a flight back to England. And he wanted to get, to get it on the way from Singapore while he was still in charge before he handed over. On the other hand, he didn't want it to land in England under two years or he'd have to pay duty on it. So he briefed his, his crew to take it easy on the way back so they didn't arrive in England before this date. And they hated him so much they went right through the throttles that uh, put every power on they could and got there plenty of time to get the paper of duty on. And there aren't many people who are disliked as much as that. We had some very eccentric people in the Air Force at one time. There was one a pair of twins in the Air Force called Atchley. They were actually brothers. They were at Cranwell together as cadets in the first course. And uh, one of them, uh, when they, they got up into trouble, they always got, a, got out of it because no one could prove which one it was who was there. And there was one of them had an alibi, you see. And no one could say it, that it was him who was with me. Or was there. And when, um, and they, when they were at Cranwell, the cadets, one of them was a great chap at, at amateur theatricals. And he went into uh, the local seaside resort there and where the mayor was going to open a new here. and everything was ready for this. And this fellow, dressed up to look like a mayor, and had changed and everything else, came along in, in a hard Rolls Royce, stopped outside the mayor, he went in and cut the ribbons, <laughs> and got back in the car and drove off, and the mayor came up about two minutes later. <laughs> that sort of silly thing. <laughs> and he, he was, um, when he was a, co a commandant at Cranwell, a cadet passed him one morning, and said, good morning, sir, but didn't salute. So he called him back and said, next time you pass me, salute. And you can cut out the inaccurate weather report. <laughs> and, 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 sort of chat. And when he was an air officer commanding a group, he was doing his annual in, in, inspection. And there was a guard of honor laid on when he arrived at the station. When he was inspecting, he came up to an airman who had a, one of these ghastly red strawberry marks on his face, a birthmark. And to the station master's horror, he said to the fellow, what's that mark on your face? And there's a... It's a birthmark, sir. And Betty said, you see my twin brother? Terrible the things you're born with, isn't it? <laughs> I moved on, I moved on. And when he was at the AOC there, he, he decided it was time he flew a jet. So he had a, this was about 1948 or so, he had a, 
a vampire flown over to this rather small grass airfield where he was based. And he took off in his jet and really enjoyed himself. He came back and landed. And he couldn't get the flaps to come down. And he hadn't checked, read up the pilot's notes on the emergency procedures. So he had to come in without any flaps. He, meant, he landed very fast. He overshot the airfield and went through a fence at the other end of the airfield. When he got back to the hangar, he got a telegram from the air officer commanding the 11 group in Uxbury. Uh, it was on the same course at, at, at Cranwell years before, a fellow called um, Lord Bandon, Earl of Bandon, always known as Paddy Bandon, or the abandoned Earl. And Paddy Bandon sent him a telegram saying, Congratulations, I hear you're the first air officer to go through the barrier. I heard the bang from here. <laughs> we'll stop there. Again, we're out of tape. I'll um, hand back over to Michael. We'll probably finish up on the next tape, but got a few questions about the end of the war and then about your career after. I had one question that you might know the answer to that if you do I'd like to mention on tape is you mentioned that